Garcia is a community leader, political activist, and aspiring farmer who dedicates her time to family and community. During her years of service uh, to the New Mexico Acequia Association, Acequias have built a movement around the principle that el agua es la vida, water is life, and have achieved major policy changes to protect agricultural water rights locally and statewide. The association also launched a program, Sembrando Semillas, to involve youth in agricultural traditions and to increase cultivation of foods of cultural significance to communities in New Mexico. Paul is also president of La Merced de Santa Gertrudas uh, de la Mora, a Mexican community land grant and founding member of the New Mexico Food and Seed, Seed Sovereignty Alliance, a collaboration between Acequia and Native American farmers to protect and promote native seeds. Paula, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. This is Paula Garcia. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the webinar. It's a really great honor to uh, be part of this webinar with the National Good Food Network and the Wallace Center. Um, I am the director of the New Mexico Aztec Association, and the Aztec Association is a statewide membership-based grassroots organization of uh, communal irrigation systems that have uh, been in place in New Mexico for uh, over 400 years, um, and they are our uh, synthesis of the, the traditions um, that were part of the, the native cultures of the Americas, as well as institutions brought from uh, from Spain and, and Asia and Africa. And they continue to provide water to thousands of farmers in New Mexico. Uh, we estimate that about 200,000 acres of, of um, prime irrigated farmland is uh, is part of the Aseca system in New Mexico, and about 80,000 different parciantes who are the irrigators that make up the Aseca. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, about our experience working in New Mexico and, and giving some reflections on uh, agriculture in the Southwest generally. And our our work has been really grounded in uh, retaining historic land and water rights. And more recently, we have uh, begun to address the issues surrounding uh, rebuilding of local food systems. Most of our our work over the last 20 years has been in defense of agricultural water rights from commodification. Our organization is predominantly uh, Hispano or Indo-Hispano, um, and it is uh, a, an organization that has um, really been been grounded in the land rights movement that goes back to 100 and, uh, over 150 years ago when the um, communal lands of the Spanish and Mexican land grants were um, privatized and usurped uh, um, after a uh, few United States took uh, uh, took these lands, and so it's it's really been more of a, a struggle of land-based people to retain a connection to the land, and I think just you know reflecting on on agriculture in the Southwest generally, um, what what you'll see is that it's a different historical cultural context um, from other parts of the country. Every every region and every uh, state has a, its own unique history. And for the Southwest, it's particularly um, uh, interesting because we have some of the most ancient agricultural civilizations in the Southwest with, uh, with the Pueblo uh, cultures um, being here from, from time immemorial and some of the most ancient agricultural traditions in North America. And so it's very rich um, culturally, uh, and and there are uh, many peoples and many different food traditions that are part of the Southwest. It's um it's an area that is very arid, and to say that it's arid is an understatement. Um, it, water is very scarce and more scarce in some areas than in others, and so the, the West and the Southwest in particular um, has a lot of issues around. Uh, water availability and, and farmland. And uh, in contrast to places like maybe the Midwest or even um, other areas of the country where agriculture from uh, an airplane, you can look down, it looks like a quilt. Here in the Southwest, agriculture, it looks more like um, 
ribbons of green wherever you where there's a spring or where there's running water. Uh, that's where you see uh, most of the agriculture happening, or uh, in very carefully nurtured places that where where uh, communities have been for many years. That you see um, agriculture happening. So it, in the traditional uh, approach to agriculture, um, whether it be Native American or the Hispano, uh, it tends to be smaller scale. You see a lot more subsistence agriculture, and um, you see more traditional crops being grown. And, and I think that's something that really characterizes the traditional agriculture of the Southwest. Um, you can contrast that with uh, more commercialized agriculture, which is in the Southwest, which is part of the big um, federal um, reclamation projects that, that were created by the Bureau of Reclamation, um, the big irrigation districts that tend to have more uh, commercial scale, large scale, or medium scale agriculture. So, so there's quite a diversity of agriculture in the Southwest, um, but, but what I'll be talking about is, is primarily the small scale uh, traditional types of agriculture and uh, some of the, the, uh, the values that we bring to the table when we're talking about food um, and food traditions and community health and well-being, um, as well as some of the challenges that uh, small scale traditional producers face and trying to um, rebuild local food systems. Uh, so like I said earlier, a lot of our work has been focused on defense of land and water rights. And part of the reason, like um, as I was mentioning, is that water is very scarce, farmland is very scarce. And so um, the traditional land-based peoples have uh, for generations had to struggle to retain access to those. And um, for the Native American, uh, uh, people of the nations, um, that has been a generational struggle uh, to retain ancestral lands. And uh, for most of those, there are now um, lands that are set aside that, that belong only to tribes, and, and, uh, and those are um, communally held. They're held for the community, although in some, depending on the tribe, you'll have uh, areas that certain families can use. Um, for the Hispano uh, communities, uh, which is what I'm most familiar with and where I, what I belong to, uh, the lands are, are completely uh, privatized, um, as the water rights are completely privatized, and um, and there is a lot of pressure to develop uh, farmland and a lot of pressure to commodify water and move it off of agricultural lands. And so it's very imperative that our people, the, the land-based people, the small-scale producers, um, can uh, uh, revitalize agriculture and achieve a, a, a level of economic viability to where uh, we can keep these uh, precious uh, farmlands that are far and few between and the water rights and agricultural production. Uh, the NMAA started the, um, uh, joined the Northern New Mexico Good Food Network uh, in an effort to, to uh, invest in the infrastructure, the agricultural infrastructure and food system infrastructure in northern New Mexico to do value chain development. Um, we work with the Taos County Economic Development Corporation, uh, northern New Mexico Stockman, um, New Mexico State University and La Montanita Co-op and American Friends Service Committee. Uh, and we're, we're generating some pilot projects around demonstrating how we can rebuild uh, agricultural production at a scale that is commercially viable. Uh, and in some cases looking at how we can aggregate product so that um, we can achieve economies of scale to get um, what was historically more of a subsistence scale agriculture to a scale that we can get to where we can produce for schools or local retailers. Um, another partnership is the Good Food for New Mexico Families um, with Farm to Table and American Friends Service Committee. Uh, again, looking at um, working uh, directly with local communities uh, to um, uh, invest in the, the capacity of those communities um, in order that they can begin to uh, uh, put land back into production or to um, uh, increase the, uh, um, the complexity at the local level in terms of uh, their infrastructure, whether it be for uh, cold storage, distribution, um, food processing facilities, 
And so we're really we're really having to essentially build up build from the ground up our local food systems. Although we have such a long legacy of agricultural production, um, a lot of our collaborative efforts are focused on the collective infrastructure needs of the entire region. So um, that's a quick overview of, of the work, um, the, the way that we've approached the work. And um, we have also um, engaged in another partnership called the, the New Mexico Food and Seed Sovereignty Alliance. And that has been um, an effort to focus on seeds. And like I said, in the arid southwest, land and water are very precious. Um, but the seeds are equally uh, precious. And they are uniquely adapted to our climate. And um, we have uh, begun a, um, it's five years now where we have an annual conference and seed exchange between the Azequia and the Pueblo and tribal communities um, in an effort to disseminate more uh, local seed so that we can retain um, the traditional seed stocks and increase those seed stocks. And so approaching things from that cultural standpoint, um, we've been able to build relationships that are very meaningful and realizing that the resiliency of our agricultural traditions doesn't only come from the economic viability, but that there's a very strong cultural root um, to growing food. There's a lot of faith that's involved in growing food. And um, it's part of the cultural heritage uh, that, that makes us who we are as a people, gives us an identity. And um, it's, 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 uh, it's very essential that, that we work together uh, collaboratively um, in order that our communities can be healthy in the future. So. Um, with that introduction, I just want to uh, point out that both um, both Pam and Don, who are going to be presenting shortly, are very valued partners. Um, and um, both of their work is really essential uh, to, to what's happening here in New Mexico. And I just want to give you an, a, a quick snapshot um, that I didn't mention earlier. And and the, the three organizations represented to, on today's webinar have have um, really um, had to had to uh, understand these basic characteristics, at least in New Mexico, is that the vast majority of the, the, the farms in New Mexico um, make under $10,000 a year, according to the agricultural census. Uh, it's upwards of you know 90% or something like that. Um, the, um, the number of Hispanic farmers is almost uh, 40, uh, 40, 45 percent, which is which is pretty high. Uh, for the Native American farmers, um, I'm not sure what the number was because from year to the 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 census changed that the way that they counted Native American farms uh, before 2007 or 2002 maybe uh, a whole tribe was counted as one farm. So what you see from one census to the next is things like a, you know. Uh, 14,000 <laughs> 14, percent increase or 2,000 percent increase in the number of Native American farms, and that's because they were severely um, undercounted uh, in the past. And so, um, the the number of Hispanic farmers increased from 2002 to 2007, apparently by 35, 40 percent. But it was only because they were undercounted. And so, what you have is a small scale agriculture that's really been um, underserved. And um, that's one of the things that we're trying to address through our work. And uh, one of our partners, the NMSU Sustainable Ag Center at Alcalde, um, has been really instrumental in improving our count in the agricultural census. And so those are all um, really important uh, things to take into consideration in the Southwest, where you have a lot of um, traditional farmers from, from Hispanic or Native American backgrounds. Uh, so with that, I'll just go ahead and conclude my part of the, the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. It really helps to set the stage for um, work in, in New Mexico. Uh, and it's uh, great to hear your great work. Um, I'm going to introduce um, the, the next two presenters uh, together. They, they do um, a lot of work together. So uh, uh, and. You, you may hear a little bit of banter between them. So I'm, I'm just going to let them go to it. So I'm going to introduce them both now.
Uh, Pam Roy is co-director of Farm to Table, a New Mexico-based nonprofit working on farm and ranch issues, farm to school, farmers market development, and food and agricultural policy. She has close to 20 years of organizational development, convening, and farmers market experience, and has worked internationally in lesser developed countries. She's a co-founder co and steering committee member of the Southwest Marketing Network and works on many of the network's programs, including tribal farmers market development uh, and uh, initiated regional food policy councils. She's the director of the New Mexico Food and Agricultural Policy Council that works on state and federal policy advocating for food system issues including health, nutrition, hunger, and family size farm and ranch policies and programs. She has served as a board officer of the Community Food Security Coalition for the past six years and as president of the North American Farmers Direct Marketing Association. And Don Bustos has more than 20 years experience as a New Mexican farmer and currently serves as the program director for the American Friends Service Committee New Mexico, providing farm to farmer training and working on farm policy. He operates a certified organic vegan farm in Española, New Mexico and was named the New Mexico Farmer of the Year in 2006. Don serves on the boards of several organizations including Western Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, Western Sustainable Agriculture Working Group, National Campaign for Sustainable Agriculture, New, New Mexico Asequia Association, Rio Arriba County Extension Service Committee, uh, adv Service Advisory Committee, the Santa Cruz de la Canada uh, Land Grant Board, and the National Immigrant Farming Initiative. Don also has received the Leyendecker Award from New Mexico State University. Okay, Don, I believe you're you're going first. All right. Thank you, uh, uh, Jeff. Uh, maybe uh, the slide show is we can start to present those uh, slides. And uh, just kind of going through the Bueno Comida para la Gente, as Paula had mentioned, is, uh, is a product of the Good Food Network, the National Good Food Network, and uh, how we've kind of gone forward with that a little bit. I think she well described it as to how it, uh, how it operates and then how we came by it. Uh, next slide, please. Can we, uh, Jeff, there you go, thank you. Uh, a little bit of history of the American Friends Service Committee. Our mission is to protect land and water rights and promote economic viability through sustainable agriculture. And that, uh, that uh, basically is just saying is, you know, just trying to make enough money to pay the bills uh, as, as farmers and ranchers. We're not trying to get rich or anything, but we're trying to make sure that there's enough uh, economic viability in it where we can continue to retain our land and water for future generations. And we accomplished this mission through farmer-to-farmer -farmer training programs uh, and to provide technical assistance to marginalized farmers, farmers and working on state uh, and uh, federal policy levels. Uh, part of what we've been doing is we work under American Friends is a national and international organization. Uh, they have offices in different states or all the states in, in uh, the United States. And we have regional areas. Uh, and I work out of the Pacific region area. In New Mexico, we're unique because we work under uh, economic justice uh, framework. And uh, the framework is uh, viability for sustainable agricultural areas. That's kind of where the American Friends Service Committee is and how they've been helping New Mexico. They've been helping New Mexico since 1976. The programs have focused in northern New Mexico. And then about five years ago, uh, through the leadership of W. Lujan and committee members, uh, we moved the program to uh, central New Mexico or the middle Rio Grande Conservancy district area and in Albuquerque, the largest city, so that we could start to help promote a viable agricultural uh, projects in an urban setting. And uh, we'll talk about that next, if you like. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, you know, this is just kind of going a little bit more about what Paula had talked about with the Good Food Network, and I'll leave it there. Next one, please. Uh, and these are some of the things that we came up with, with uh, what we identified as barriers through a year work of, of programming and development. Uh, out of these uh, barriers, we started to identify uh, funding sources that would allow us to move the project forward. And out of this came an application to the uh, CFP programs, uh, where we were awarded a, a, a grant to do farmer-to-farmer -farmer training programs in the Albuquerque area itself. 
Next slide, please. Uh, and then part of the thing is that we came up with a focus groups, uh, produce grains, and we decided to work on the produce and grain production in the Albuquerque area itself. Uh, next slide. Uh, then out of the whole program and out of the uh, community food uh, uh, program uh, areas, we started to form a network in the South Valley around the urban development of sustainable agriculture, and it was called the Agricultura Network a collaboration of South Valley organizations farming para la comunidad, and it's farming for the people in their communities. What we're doing in this program, we're identifying markets, and at this specific market we identified was the Albuquerque School District through what they described through a South Valley cluster group. And what happened through work that Pam had done and other people had done in New Mexico, they were able to get some resources allocated by the state of New Mexico to help this school district purchase local product from local growers. Over the first few years that we heard about it, the uh, resources were still sitting there and they weren't able to uh, distribute those financial resources to farmers because there wasn't enough farmers growing food that the Albuquerque school districts could purchase uh, from directly local farmers. So we took that barrier and identified growers in the South Valley working through three different organizations that were willing to put you know, resources and members on the line to revitalize their uh, agriculture in the South Valley itself. So we started to work with three different organizations. Next slide, please. To go ahead and start to create a network of people that will start to meet the demand of the Albuquerque School Districts itself. And you can see what we had looked at, where we were looking at the vision was to create small organic farms, which create jobs, healthy communities, and then provide local food into our school districts themselves. And uh, so it's more than just farming itself. It's about creating a healthy community. It's about creating a healthy system where the growers, the farmers, the community members make enough money selling to direct local markets, such as the schools, and then feeding their children good, healthy food. So you have a circle of creating healthy communities within all sectors itself. It's about farmers making the money they need to make, the schools getting the food they need, and then the kids being the recipients of that good food itself so that you create this nice circle of good, healthy community and healthy children. Uh, and, and, and the method that we're using is comprehensive farmer-to-farmer -farmer training programs. And what we do that is we've kind of gone back to more of a traditional learning style instead of going to a more modern learning style where people are confined to classrooms. Our classroom is the big outdoors and what we're doing is we're uh, actually training on the farms and projects that are going on right now. Uh, an example this last week that happened is that uh, we planted between the network all three people working together, all three organizations working together, prep land uh, identify land in an urban setting, prep the land, working together. Last week, this last week, we planted 3,000 asparagus plants, 500 blackberry plants, and we've gotten three 30 by 96 coal frames in production so that the network can start meeting that supply for their local markets. So it's not this one-on-one -on -one kind of a message where people compete against each other. It's the community working together to be able to meet that larger demand itself. So that's kind of like the shift that we've done in the way we've approached it, is that the network and everybody working together will create a stronger synergy so that we can impact the community even more directly instead of each farmer or our organization competing against each other. And uh, about a month ago, we had a historical meeting is where all three farmers sat around the table along with the other trainees and uh, figured out a crop plan where everybody was complementing each other's product. So instead of competing, they were working to create a farm plan, which is pretty unique in New, in New Mexico, to bring these people together and have them compete together. Not compete, but to work together so they're not competing. That, that is pretty innovative, and, and that's kind of the example that we follow with traditional training and farming in New Mexico. Uh, next uh, slide, please. 
uh, and these are the three organizations that we've chosen to work with, uh, not only because uh, of who they are, but because of the capacity and of their uh, commitment to the spiritual aspect of what we're doing, the community aspect, and then the connection to the land itself. Uh, and I'll just go briefly, Emerging Communities is Pablo Lopez. Pablo has been working with us for about six years. La Placita Institute, uh, the director is Albino Garcia. Albino has the Placita Institute. Is the Placita is the center of community, and everything radiates from there. And Valle Encantado is more of a traditional Hispanic community in the Atrisco neighborhood that was one of the first uh, ejidos or land grants established in New Mexico. So those three partners were chosen uh, because of they're connected to the land, they're connected to the communities, and then their commitment to the project itself. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, this is part of the comprehensive training that we're doing, uh, and we're doing it hands-on. As you see, we're doing everything day by day as it comes up. So there's no cutting corners. Keep trainees are committed to a year of training. Uh, so it takes a whole year to learn a farming process, and you just don't learn it out of a book and then go try to replicate it. It's about really learning relationships, understanding, helping each other, and then building on each other's strengths throughout the whole year itself. The next, please. Uh, the sharing of labor. This is one of the cold frames that was purchased through the Community Food Security Grant. Uh, each site is getting two cold frames, 30 by 96, because our main object is to grow in the middle of winter. And we're going to be doing it using nothing but solar energy so that the growers don't have to spend the capital that they earn on energy itself, but it's provided free by the, by the sun. And uh, with techniques that we've developed over 20 years of growing in northern New Mexico, we've developed a technique that allows us to use nothing but the sun that will produce produce in the middle of the winter, January and February, that we then will distribute right back to the schools themselves. And the idea of aggregating product is that no one farmer on these small pieces of land could meet the demand, but all three of them working together and then expanding the network as more markets become developed, that allows them for that aggregation to meet those big, larger institutional buyers themselves. Next. Uh, here's a few more photographs. I want to just kind of briefly talk about a little bit of the challenges that are in New Mexico itself is one that uh, a lot of these organizations have been uh, traditionally have been abused or used by outside organizations that come in, promise things that are going to happen, and then when the money runs out, the organizations kind of disappear themselves. You know, in this one project itself in the South Valley, I've, I've been invested in it over seven years. And after three to four years, there's enough trusted uh, relationships and enough knowing each other that they allowed us to participate with them to uh, submit a federal grant. Whereas before, you know, people would come in and they'd just kind of like blow them off. Oh, no, we've known your people. We see what happens. And then they leave. As soon as the resources are out, they leave. Our whole motion about this network is that when, we, when this grant is finished in three years, these organizations have the capacity to apply, receive, and manage their own resources in an appropriate way. So they don't become dependent on us to do any of the work, but they themselves take the ownership and move that forward. Uh, so there's this shift about how communities are approached and how they're empowered, and then how they move forward with that also. So that's kind of like what we're talking about within the Agricultura Network and the project that AFSE is doing on. And you know, maybe, maybe there'll be a little bit more chance to talk about some of the other challenges that occur with uh, grassroots organizations trying to compete on different levels uh, to acquire the resources. And that's one of the bigger challenges in New Mexico is we have what people uh, are, 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 are sometimes perceived as gatekeepers. And then how do these gatekeepers engage people of community? And then how do they turn that power over to land-based people so that they can continue to move forward within their own communities. Uh, and then it starts to address a lot of the social issues of the gentrification of traditional communities. Uh, you know, if people have enough resources where they can create a living off of their farmland, then that slows that gentrification down somewhat. So there's a lot of social issues involved in what we're doing, but we're, 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 we're trying to wrap them around a sustainable agricultural project so that people can hold to their land, water, 
and grow enough food to uh, support their families. Don, I have a quick clarification question from the audience. There are some great questions, and I'm excited to ask them of, uh, of you uh, at, at the Q&A section. Um, but one clarification question was, are, are these three farmer organizations, or is it three farmers? You know, these are three community-based organizations that have worked in their communities for several years. Uh, but what we have done is they've identified in their communities three beginning farmers, and I forgot to mention that none of these uh, farmers have ever had any experience at all. So they're three beginning farmers, and we're training them from, you know, everything from business planning to how deep the seed goes to when they should weed, how much water they should be having on their crops. So uh, uh, we're working with organizations, uh, and, and uh, but we're training farmers so that farmers become independent. And uh, what, what we think is going to happen or what we see happening is the organizations are like sponsorship or host organizations where trainings are occurring and then people are going out in communities and replicating what they're learning. Uh, and, and, and that's taking off more and more. We have created the, uh, the uh, trainings for three to six trainees per year, but we're having uh, several people coming in from the community asking and then learning and then replicating what they're seeing in these trainings in their own sites. So we're getting a lot more replication than we had anticipated. Great, thanks. Okay, Pam. Oh, great. Um, thank you all. Yeah, this is Pam Roy, uh, as Jeff mentioned. And um, I just love hearing Don and Paula's um, work. And um, it just engages me even more in my own. and makes me think about how much more thoughtful I want to be. <laughs> so anyway. Having said that, um, a little bit about us. Uh, Farm to Table is a nonprofit organization. We've been in existence for about 10 years now. And we've, we're actually focused in um, three areas of work uh, that are pretty broad um, that we've been building on since our um, inception. Um, one is uh, the Southwest Marketing Network, which I'll talk a little bit more about when I talk about our work with the Good Food Network. Um, and the Southwest Marketing Network itself, um, we conceived um, about seven or eight years ago uh, as a collective of organizations and farmers and ranchers in the southwest, so Arizona, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and tribal communities to work on uh, common issues um, and really focus on direct marketing opportunities in the region. Um, and to build on that, uh, Farm to Table um, also uh, decided at the point in time that it um, it started that one of our major efforts was to work on policy work. And so that policy work has been very much at the local level, um, at the state level, and then in the region as well, um, helping to build uh, a network of, of voices and advocacy, mostly to work on the on a federal level issues uh, from the region. And um, that builds on a little something that Don talked about, and I know we'll have a little more discussion about in, in a bit, which is um, really advocating for resources for this region that are um, that fit the needs of these communities, these very d diverse communities that Don and Paula um, so well um, helped uh, helped us sort of see as um, this region, um, and and that our needs might be different than regions in the Northwest or the Northeast or the Southeast, that kind of thing. And so that kind of communal advocacy is something that our three organizations and the groups we work with are building on through policy work. And then the third area, which Don has also touched upon, and I'll build on his uh, presentation a bit, is the Farm to School initiative. So um, those three areas, we, if we started Farm to School um, in New Mexico, and Don was a part of that uh, around 2001. And I'm going to use our next slide to kind of give you an idea of, of sort of the broader, so, yeah, there you go, just um, what, what all of our work has brought us to, which is we have to look at um, our food and farming system as a whole system and um, think about all the points of, of um, uh, intervention and injection and the resources needed. Um, and Don really talked a lot about that through the projects and programs that he's been working on and, and is helping people build. And so um, we, we always 
sort of look at this map of taking it from the land, um, uh, you know, from the farming and ranching communities to what are the next things we need, and looking at what are the strengths of New Mexico um, and our and our regions within New Mexico, um, and then what are the gaps. So. Um, packing, processing, storage. Infrastructure is a huge issue here in New Mexico as a very large and ge geographically diverse state. Um, uh, we need more infrastructure when it comes to um, building agriculture back into our communities and also strengthening the agriculture that exists. Uh, and then the distribution system, too. We have got some miles out here <laughs> to cover. Um, and, uh, and then miles to also grocery stores and food outlets. So we are one of those states, as a, as a food desert. Um, we don't really like to use that term. Um, but we have a very large distances. We have people who travel as much as 70 miles. 77 oh, miles one way to a grocery store, and some of those people don't even have access to a vehicle. So this is, you know, those are big issues for us. And as we began to work on farm to school and policy work and continue to build on direct marketing work through farmers markets and other venues, we recognized the need to look at this as a bigger picture, a whole picture. And what in our state is missing, you know, and then how can we build on that? And then who are the partners? Where are the resources? Um, so that we can really build a healthy, um, a healthy community um, with um, fresh foods, healthy foods that are culturally appropriate for um, our diverse communities. Um, and really looking at the long-term picture, which is the health of our children, um, as well as the ability for our communities to really have economic wealth within them as well. So next slide. So I'm going to build a little bit on what Don was talking about with Farm to School as an example, because I think it's one that people are uh, uh, really familiar with. Um, so here in New Mexico, when we really looked at Farm to School back in 2001, we said, OK, we need to combine uh, numerous activities. One, looking at the policy, what are the barriers and what are the opportunities. Um, we need to find more funding for this. And also, what's the goal? Healthier kids are, is our major goal, and being able to provide our uh, farmers here in New Mexico and in the region with um, a, a, a more economic opportunities building into and new, um, new options um, beyond potentially farmers' market selling. So broaden that, you know, provide the opportunity to sell to schools as well. So we did have a piece of legislation in 2001. And then, um, and then we started through a USDA Community Food Project grant um, uh, to begin the Farm to School program. We did it just in Santa Fe. And Don was one of the very first growers ever to participate in the Farm to School program and continues to do that. And the Santa Fe Public Schools, we thought we'd only get three schools. It went district-wide in those three years. Um, buying you know, when, when available. And now they have a person who's actually focused on purchasing as well as providing nutrition education. So then we said, what's the next step? What is another barrier in the schools to children's nutrition? And it really was um, the competitive foods in the schools and the junk food and all those vending machines. So in 2006, our New Mexico Food, Policy, food and Agriculture Policy Council, which is part of our work, um, uh, we actually went to the legislature with a ro wide array of agencies and organizations working collectively to advocate to get junk food out of the schools. And it did take a year, um, and uh, those rules were promulgated. We were one of the first couple of states in the nation to actually do that. Um, so then our next step was to say, all right, now we really need to get the state to invest in school meal programs. So going back to the example Don gave, which was the Albuquerque Cluster Schools, one of our senators was able to get um, initial funding for farm to school from the state and um, to basically provide to um, uh, a half a dozen, I mean, 12 schools in the valley of Albuquerque um, that serve 6,000 students. And that was $75,000. It was a good start. And, um, and as Don said, really it, now the need is to continue to develop the farm to school program in that region. And he's really doing it at that very local level with local producers in, the, in that school district, being able to provide direct to those schools is so important. Um, and then broader than that, 
We've continued to build through our Farm to School program, and Lee Adams, who's our director for that, in, in partnership with the Department of Agriculture, really helping farmers um, who have wanted to sell to schools, helping them to aggregate their products like apples and peaches and, um, and pears as examples, um, and then provide to um, various school districts that are willing to actually pay out of their school budget for fresh fruits and vegetables. So over this, these past few years, we've been able to build that program there are now 10 school districts serving about 160,000 kids in New Mexico that are purchasing New Mexico grown fresh fruits and vegetables um, from farmers here. Um, and now it's, it's getting there. We're getting closer to about $400,000 in income back into New Mexico farmers' pockets. And with the help of folks like Don and, and the work that he's doing and Lee and the Department of Agriculture and other groups, they're really getting engaged. And the farmers themselves, who are now investing back into their local community and in, into their own farms to um, increase their opportunities to sell to schools, uh, I think we're going to see more momentum on this program. The other um, thing that was really important here was that the Department of Agriculture was able to access several large um, uh, container refrigerated units to put in northern New Mexico for producers to hold apples, potatoes, and things that, that they could hold into the winter. So we had schools this winter actually even getting apples into March, early March. Um, and uh, they were delicious. They were fabulous. Um, so they, we're really looking at season extension as well as something, as Don's doing with the greenhouses, cold storage is another one of those needs and opportunities. Uh, next slide, slide, please. And so building on state, we've worked with um, collectively with national groups like the Community Food Security Coalition, the National Sustainable Agriculture Campaign um, a Coalition, and other groups um, on things like the Farm Bill, and um, really advocated wholeheartedly for the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Initiative, uh, which got some very good funding in New Mexico. This year has $1.5 million in that program, ramping up to $2 million. We have 66 schools are currently um, uh, um, accessing that program and providing fresh fruits and vegetables to kids. Again, another opportunity for our New Mexico farmers to be able to build into that activity in the schools. The other was, of course, um, getting the procurement um, or the uh, preference uh, change uh, from geo and getting really geographic preference so that our schools really had more opportunity to, to purchase locally. And now um, we're advocating, uh, of course, in the child nutrition reauthorization uh, for farm to school funding at the federal level, $50 million. So building on the policy pieces, but also building on um, really the ground from the ground up uh, work. Next uh, slide, please. So I mentioned before um, the, that we were looking at more of a whole a whole system as well. So we realized that we also really needed to look at um, rural communities, their their assets, uh, and we want to make sure that they maintain those assets, like stores, food stores, uh, and um, and the infrastructure. So I'll just briefly. Um, uh, say that we are uh, really focusing in on this now, and with the work with Paula and Don's group and other groups, we want to work um, more directly with communities to help them either uh, maintain and enhance grocery stores, or in some of our communities that have lost a grocery store, and maybe now people are driving that 70 miles or 50 miles to a grocery store, to maybe even looking at something a little bit more um, creative like a food hub, combining some of um, the retail um, food issues that a community has, and even just primary access to emergency food and potentially com combining those into one place. So looking at how people can be innovative in a community around um, food resources, and then and then building on that, really trying to then um, uh, uh, provide opportunities for local producers to sell uh, in their own communities, um, not only at farmers markets, but also stores or um, into buying clubs or that kind of thing. Um, next slide, please. 
And I also think that one of the things that's really to our advantage of the work we've been doing for a long time is that um, we're beginning to hear states all across the country um, and certainly at the federal level that local food sy system work is where we should be now and where sh communities should be working. So I think we have an incredible opportunity um, uh, ahead of us. Uh, so one thing, going back to the Southwest Marketing Network, one of the things we've been doing is also working with tribal communities. And what they asked us to do was to help them network better around projects and programs. So we actually have helped um, four tribal communities in, in New Mexico and Arizona uh, start their own farmers markets. Um, and from their vantage point, what works for them, not necessarily what works in some other community. Um, sometimes it's sharing and bartering. Um, and it's also around food traditions. Um, and so cultivating those types of venues um, in relationship to what's meaningful to them and important to their communities. Um, again, I mentioned the Farm to School program. Um, we also are the um, Southwest lead uh, a group for the National Farm to School Network. So we've integrated that into our Southwest Marketing Network work, so working with our neighboring states and communities on farm to school and best practices, what's working, what isn't working, and again, working from that regional advocacy level um, on national issues. Um, next slide, please. Um, and as Don showed, he had also showed some of the greenhouse work that they've been doing um, with farmers. Uh, we've been working with some of the Native American communities to do the same, which is um, season extension, um, also working with some of the tribal community colleges and um, helping them develop uh, work within their own programs and sort of expand them um, uh, really with the eye on agriculture. Uh, next, please. And um, I think that's it. I think that's a good place to stop. Uh, oh, and so, well, a couple of things just really quickly. Don brought up something really important about capacity building within groups. What we've realized in our own organization is that uh, we could spend all of our staff's time and probably half a dozen other people um, just working with communities to help them build their own capacity, not only in the field, um, to the market, but also, as Don mentioned, the capacity to really organize for themselves, um, access resources for themselves. Um, and so we've moved into more work around helping communities assess these kinds of issues for themselves, uh, looking at um, organizational structures, um, and then being able to help them um, work towards even legal structures. Um, like two of my colleagues have been working with um, uh, a, a, a group of Native American farmers on the Navajo Nation um, uh, called the NIT-AG to actually get their 501c3 nonprofit status, which took about a year and a half of paperwork and working through that process. And they just submitted their paperwork to the federal government last week. So we're really excited about it. And um, again, helping them work on things that are going to help their community themselves and bring resources home directly to them. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. Look forward to more conversation. Yeah, Pam, that was, that was great. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce our final presenter. Um, Janie Sims Hip is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation and is serving as senior advisor to the Secretary for Tribal Affairs and is director of the new Office of Tribal Relations at USDA. This office reports directly to the Secretary and is responsible for coordinating tribal consultation and collaboration across the department and all 17 agencies of the department. She has an extensive background in local, regional, tribal food system challenges and opportunities and has served for many years in the National Center for Agricultural Law. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Great. I'm just tuning in. Um, and thank you for including me on this panel this afternoon as well. Um, uh, given the time that we have left, I'm going to just quickly go through my slides. I think uh, my contact information for those of you on the webinar is on the very last slide. Any of you who are on the webinar are welcome to call or drop me an email at any time or work through Jeff, and I'll be glad to continue to uh, answer questions. As, as any of you know who've ever heard anyone uh, do a presentation, 
that has to do with available resources at the federal level, it always leads to more questions. So, um, and I apologize if we have any kind of background noise at all. I'm in a, a hotel business center, so I'm trying to do this um, on the road. And so I beg your uh, uh, indulgence there. And if you could uh, go to the next slide, Jeff. Jeff? There you go. Uh, the Office of Tribal Relations that I'm the director of now was created in the uh, FY 2010 budget. Um, it's the first time that the USDA has had a full-blown Office of Tribal Relations that's going to be staffed. Uh, with uh, numerous program specialists and assistants to work across um, all um, of the agencies of the department and be the central point of contact for tribal governments, communities, and individuals. You know, and we're going to work very closely with the Office of Advocacy and Outreach, uh, which is where the 2501 program, to which I'm going to refer in just a little bit, uh, the Outreach to Socially Disadvantaged Producers um, program has uh, uh, rested. They just uh, put that request for applications out on the street, and I think it just closed not too long ago. And it is one of the resources I was going to refer to today. But the Office of Tribal Relations uh, reports directly to Secretary Vilsack, as do I. Next slide, Jeff. Uh, there's significant in initiatives of interest to uh, the audiences today that are emerging um, under Secretary Vilsack. Um, one of the um, early initiatives that, that he and Deputy Secretary Merrigan uh, got going very quickly was, and it is led by the Deputy Secretary, is the Know Your Farmer initiative, which is focusing very much, uh, like I, I like to say, like a laser beam on local regional food systems, farm to school, and all of the related issues uh, specific to improving the community's connection to uh, farmers and to improving the infrastructure that supports uh, local regional food systems and such initiatives as the Farm to School, which is just you know one of many. What we've been doing for almost a year now, or pretty close to a year, is to uh, pull people from all of the agencies of the department together on a regular basis to try to really get in the weeds um, about uh, regulatory issues that might be blocking um, or could be barriers to, um, to uh, helping more local regional food systems to emerge and, and really working out any kind of uh, issues in, in improving the ability for farm to school and, and similar initiatives at the local level to really you know, gain a foothold and, and continue to grow. And so I, I, I don't need to tell very many people <laughs> that, that we have a secretary and a deputy secretary and an entire uh, administration within the department who are very much aware of and involved and have been involved in a lot of these uh, issues for some time and very supportive uh, of same. Um, so um, looking ahead a little bit, I will tell you also that uh, the FY 2011 budget uh, from the president, uh, which, as you know, is still uh, proposed um, budget has not been ruled on by Congress as yet, but it contains a fairly substantial healthy food financing initiative which is going to cut across not only USDA but Treasury and some other departments in federal government uh, that and the dollar amount is on your slide, but it would b bring financial support to building f f the infrastructure necess necessary to engage more in local regional food systems toward the goal of healthy food financing. Um, the other uh, la uh, large initiative that we have uh, emerging across the department is, um, is heavily focused on in regionalizing rural development um, efforts that, again, would support uh, the kind of work that Don and, and Paula and, um, and Pam have been doing for quite some time, but has also emerged in other regions of the country as well. Next slide. Um, Within the strategic planning areas of the department, which are those uh, areas that the secretary um, and the administration wants to really focus on heavily, are you know I've listed them there. But uh, our strategic plan, I think, is has finally been approved um, uh, by OMB and the and the White House, and I think we're very much on the road towards uh, immersing that within uh, the uh, agencies that are involved in the department, but. Those are just some of the key items that are contained in that, in that um, 
in that plan and focus for the department, revitalizing rural America, access to nutritional foods for children and families, sustainability in production, increasing exports and market opportunities in general. Uh, again, the food safety and food security issues, global climate change and alternative energy. Beginning farmers is uh, very much an issue. We were, uh, both the secretary and I were involved not too long ago in the Drake uh, Forum on the New American Farmer. Uh, diversity, uh, our secretary is very focused on, on having the department itself uh, mirror the diversity um, within the entire country, but uh, creating a new department that is more um, agile and more able to meet the needs of our emerging um, producers as well as those that have been around for some time. And then, and, uh, again, conservation of working lands, forest lands, rangelands, and and preserving water quality as well. Next slide. Uh, Pam already mentioned it. Uh, the child nutrition reauthorization process is already underway. Hearings are beginning. Uh, that's a very uh, strong initiative that needs to, I think, a lot of folks who are probably on the call should, should you know, keep their eyes peeled and their ears to the ground and, and just keep up with those hearings as they, as they roll out. Um, the, there are already some initiatives that uh, the Food and Nutrition Service is, is looking at. I'm having conversations particularly with what we can do to, to improve, uh, continue to improve. Uh, some of the improvements have already been put in place with regard to the food package offerings that are, that are in the SNAP and the DIPPER programs, just to name two. Uh, but I think focusing on, on those large programs that are that are very much important and relied upon by a lot of people, particularly now, um, is extremely important for us to, to you know, keep our eye on. But it also creates opportunities for producers at the local level. And uh, my, my office particularly has been very focused on how we can weave those back around into not only creating uh, opportunities for more, nutrition, more nutritional offerings within those um, within those packages, but also incorporating traditional foods into those packages as well as trying to link them to local food producers as well. Um, again, standing up, up the offices of tribal relations and advocacy and outreach are very much important. Uh, if you're in D.C., come by the fifth floor of Whitten Building, and, and uh, both of the offices are located up there, and we'd both be glad to visit with any of you on the call at any time about any of your issues. Next slide. Um, there is ongoing work across the department. Some of it is occurring in the uh, Know Your Farmer initiative, but others, other, other areas of the department work uh, also in trying to ramp up uh, farm to school um, issues and understand the, the, it, what barriers may exist, how we can uh, work with the uh, local regional food systems as well as folks like Pam Paula and Don, who are on the call, as well as the Wallace Center and others, you know, there's there's a lot of details in this. It's uh, uh, it's very important for us to focus on uh, working out the issues that still remain that would basically throw open the door, the doors for those uh, kind of connections to be made. But I think Pam and and others on the call already today have have done a fantastic job of indicating what some of the uh, lingering issues are, which are infrastructure focused. And I think it's extremely uh, challenging for a lot of producers or groups of producers to really, uh, you know, marshal up the resources necessary to do those refrigeration units and the greenhouses and the food distribution systems. And so I think that it's very important for folks uh, to really kind of not leave any stone unturned uh, right now. Uh, for instance, there are stimulus funds still remaining in the Rural Development Agency that are relating to community facility infrastructures. Some of those are loan funds. Some, some of them could be uh, grant funds. There's so many programs in rural development. Uh, you really have to kind of get in the weeds and, and have someone sit down with you and really walk through the various programs that are available and see exactly what you're trying to put in place where you are. Next slide. The other, the other area, since I seem to be moving uh, pretty rapidly into, into um, identifying kind of 
pots of uh, potential resources that folks on the call could uh, take advantage of. Um, uh, I'm just going to flip through these quite uh, quickly. Each one of them have their own eligibility requirements. Each one of them have their own uh, amounts of funding available through those particular um, mechanisms. Um, if you look at the list that I've indicated so far, I don't think you, um, on this particular slide, it starts off with the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. That agency used to be the Cooperative State Research Education and Extension Service. It changed October 1 out of the last Farm Bill to the National Institute. The RFA, the, the request for application for their largest uh, funds available is imminent, as I understand. and. One of the anticipated focus areas, I understand, is going to be in the area of nutrition. So I think you should keep your eyes peeled for that because it is a substantial um, amount of funds available in that particular uh, funding mechanism. Community Food Project has been out there as a national grant-making um, uh, uh, source. Um, it, too, is located at uh, the National Institute as it's um, administering authority. The 2501 program, which I made reference to earlier, again, is a national grant making uh, fund. It is, um, has been moved to the Office of Advocacy and Outreach, and they are administering that program um, from now on. The Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program is also another national grant making opportunity. Again, the parentheses indicate that it is located at the National Institute. Uh, the Sustainable Ag Research and Education uh, Program those uh, funds roll out through regional grant making um, uh, exercises and they all are timed to come out approximately at the same time. Again, that is run through NEPA. The base money is, but the four regions actually do all of the um, grant making activities at that level. So it's a little bit closer to the ground. Uh, Ag Marketing Service has farmers market grant making as well as other uh, grant funds. Um, they administer those at a national level. The Risk Management Agency, again, national uh, in focus, administered through their agency. The Risk Management Education Program is, is similar to the SARE program in that it is rolls out at the regional level. And then you've got rural development uh, focused on community facilities and infrastructure development as well as business development, including cooperative development. Um, and this is just a smattering. There are so many particular programs that um, I think one of, the, one of the things I always have told folks is that it's very important to have a sense of your own vision and where you see um, what it is that you're trying to do being in one, two, five, or, or ten years in a perfect world and to try to get a sense of where you're going and, and do a pretty good assessment of where you are and what the limitations are or the challenges or or potential barriers because it, unless you do that, it's really hard to kind of shop around among all of these federal, various federal programs and really find the right match. And I, I imagine Pam and Don would probably, and Paula would probably, um, you know, ring in on that as well. Uh, the other thing I, I, I ask always people to do is if they're just starting out, is to find a, a partner such as the ones that are on this call, um, as and there are others as well. Uh, to really help you to not only kind of get the hang of the of the grant making process, particularly at the national level, as well as the grants management and uh, reporting requirements that are that are standard under those all of those uh, um, avenues and really required because of the uh, transparency and accountability requirements that OMB requires all federal funds to adhere to. So I think it's really critical, particularly if you're dealing like Don is with, with uh, three or four farmers on the ground that they're not going to know that. May, maybe, maybe they will, but chances are they won't know all of these infrastructures going into it. And it's really important to have a, a partner who can, uh, can help stabilize and move forward and, and, and help to access uh, this entire world. So I think, uh, that last slide gives you a sense of some of the efforts and challenges I have seen so far in the tribal communities. And on the last slide, and, there, and all of them could be worthy of an entire two or three hours worth of conversation. Um, next slide. Which is, we've already touched on. Uh, 
and I'll leave it at that. Uh, I'll be glad to go into the weeds on that next to the last slide anytime any of you on the call might want to. Um, there are some very um, uh, challenging um, um, areas identified not, that not only uh, pertain to tribal communities, but um, uh, many of them pertain to all rural or remote communities in terms of uh, being involved in a good food network. And I'll just leave it at that and thank everyone for being on the call. Well, thank you, Janie. Uh, I want to yep. uh, try to uh, ask a, a few of these terrific questions. Um, I'm going to, Janie, since you're you're on deck here, I'm going to uh, direct a question. The first question to you. Um, the question is, how can we receive notification for NEFA RFAs, uh, including the community food projects? Well, the um, the best thing I can tell you to do, and this is from being a national program leader at that particular agency. Uh, there are so many different funding authorities that roll out of that particular agency. The best thing you can do is, is I know this maybe sounds uh, terribly boring, but is to get on their website and really poke around and, and, and uh, get a sense of, of what is available in general. Some of the avenues are available every year. Some avenues are available every two years. Uh, this new RFA that's coming out from NEPA is, is substantial and it's going to incorporate a lot of changes. So I think that it's really important to, um, if, you're, if you've ever dealt with them before at all, you probably have dealt with Liz Tucker Manny, who's with Community Food, or um, you know the folks with SARE, or the folks with uh, uh, Suresh, who's with Beginning Farmer. Um, any of those folks um, can, it, uh, can kind of guide you into, into the time periods where it's really good to surf around and be willing to commit some time to, to knowing, uh, uh, to just being on their website and seeing when the, when the, uh, the releases are imminent. Um, so uh, developing those relationships is important. Uh, keeping your ear to the ground is important. There's no doubt about it. And, but becoming knowledgeable about the various funding mechanisms themselves and just taking the time to read through all of those. They tend to be offered on the same sorts of schedules regularly every year. Mm -hmm. uh, so the more you kind of familiarize yourself with it, the more you'll see um, what the various, um, for instance, the regional risk management centers, they usually do theirs in the fall. Um, you know, it's just everyone kind of has their own schedule about when those are released. And I apologize for being so vague about it, but I think it's really the best way to go is to develop relationships, get online as much as you can, and become as familiar with those funding mechanisms as possible, and get involved with, you know, the Good Food Network and other networks. Right, yeah, definitely networking seems very impossible, very um, yeah. uh, important. The word, um, the word spreads pretty quickly when, the, when they're released. Um, uh, Paula and Don, there are a few questions around the idea of um, the farmers planning their crops and the fact that uh, s some crops have higher profit margins just by their very nature. Um, and the, the questions are, are do, is there, how, how does that planning work? Do the farmers share their profits? How have you structured your, your, the cooperatives? So Paula, maybe you want to go first? Or maybe Don. <laughs> sure, sure. I'd be, I'd be happy to. I think, uh, uh, you know, through uh, through 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 the whole process of, of how we're kind of developing market sharing is uh, we we've been looking at high value crops to start the network with, and we're we're specifically just you know there's a couple of areas that we could talk about, but I'll specifically address the good food net or the. Uh, Agricultura network in the South Valley, and then we can kind of look at northern New Mexico in a larger scope also. But briefly, in, in the South Valley through the Agricultura network, uh, we've looked at high-value crops that are not being grown in the area right now so that the network can establish themselves as a leader in market development around farmers, farmers markets, CSAs, and then the schools themselves. Uh, so we, I did, did research, identified crops that were not being grown or needs that were needed within the uh, urban setting itself. 
We kind of talked to the growers. They've decided that that's one of the niches they would like to approach. So they started to, like I mentioned earlier, to start to put in those perennials that are high-value crops themselves. Uh, the organizations are still working out some of those details of how they would work, but there will be a percentage sharing of the profits made with the sponsorship organizations themselves. Uh, that number hasn't been uh, decided yet, but all three of the growers and farmers that are are are, uh, are, are specifically being trained right now have agreed that they would like to support their sponsoring organizations. As what level, we're not sure what that means, and we're still really looking about what a, a smart business uh, plan would look like. So there's some numbers being thrown out, maybe 5 or 10 percent of, of if, if there's any profits would go back into the sponsoring organizations. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the competition of you know developing new markets, instead of everybody selling squash, everybody's felt that we should start to work on developing the markets so that they can get the uh, uh, e uh, economic uh, 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 that they need to kind of sustain themselves in that area itself. In, 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 in all parts of New Mexico, uh, we're always looking about how we do our planting according to the seasons and according to the, uh, the dates that have traditionally been honored in New Mexico along, and it, it goes right into the spirituality of it, is that we d uh, look at a lot of our plantings and irrigating into the saints' days, and I look at uh, the, uh, the Santa Clara in New Mexico, and where I live in the little village, the other Santa Clara is celebrated in August, late August, and it's with corn and chili. So we plant our crops according so that they would be harvested in time to pay, pay homage or, 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 or patronage to the saint of Dia de Santa Clara. And same thing that Dia de San Isidro. There's different crop dates that we're looking at from the religious perspective and cultural perspective that tell us when what crop should be planted. So I'm not really, uh, uh, you know, I, I just kind of wanted to give both perspectives of how we choose the crops, when we choose to plant them, and what significance they would have in each different community. And this is Pam. I would add to to that. So in the, in the middle of those those uh, two pieces that Don uh, provided uh, are, for instance, producers who produce a lot of apples. And apples traditionally have not been a high value crop um, here in, in New Mexico for many years, but they are a crop that has been here for for a long time. And up until farmers market development, um, difficult for farmers to sell uh, the as as many apples as they had, and they were still, some of them, dumping their apples and not finding the markets for them. So actually, the Farm to School program became a good venue, and it was a time when actually farmers began to organize collectively um, using some, some grading facilities together and then the cold storage units um, doing some shipping together. Still, still work in progress, um, but um, actually some of the growers are getting more for their boxes of apples than they have in the past, like $18 a box for apples to the schools, um, whereas they weren't getting the same prices before. They were getting maybe, maybe 13, $12, 13 a box um, in other markets. And the other part of that is actually some of the schools are paying less for apples um, buying local. So um, that's been a win-win. That's great. We we are already over time. I feel terrible cutting people. There are some really great questions. I'm hoping that uh, I can email them out to our panelists and uh, they can give some written answers, which we will uh, post on the website, uh, including uh, there are a couple requests for uh, contact information for um, some uh, projects and uh, partnerships. So that's great. That's what we uh, hope for at the National Good Food Network. Um, so uh, to those people who have asked questions, uh, I apologize. I don't want to go on too long. Um, I do want to thank all of our presenters, Paula Garcia, Pam Roy, Don Bustos, and Janie Hip for a wonderful presentation. I hope you were able to gain some new insight into work being done in the Southwest, as well as some insight into your own work. The National Good Food Network webinars are the third Thursday each month at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. All of our webinars are archived. This one will be archived, uh, and they're accessible at mgfn.org slash webinars.
Our next webinar on April 15th takes us across the country from this webinar to the Northeast. The Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Working Group has been studying what it means to be a regional food system and how that's different from a global food system, but also different from a local food system. They've done some groundbreaking work to start to build their regional food system in the Northeast. And you'll also hear uh, a presentation of the results of a large-scale survey of working value chains that they did. You can register for the uh, building Regional Food Systems uh, Part 1, Foundational Definitions, and the Northeast webinar at ngfn.org slash webinars. We're calling this Part 1 because three weeks later on May 6th, we'll, presenting, we'll be presenting Part 2, where we'll look uh, at this kind of work happening in the Midwest, as well as the results of what could be the first ever regional ec economic independent uh, impact study in, the, uh, in good food. Uh, register on our website and uh, take a look at the archive there. I also wanted to mention that the Community Food Security Coalition, who co-sponsored this webinar, is sponsoring two more NGFN web and webinars, uh, one on May 20th, linking diverse communities through healthy food examples from metropolitan areas as a complement to today's webinar, and one on July 15th on building local government support for good food. So mark your calendars, but uh, third Thursday of each month. Um, we will be posting summaries and registration links for these CFSC webinars coming up. Another service the NGFN provides is to connect people uh, at, at national uh, and regional convenings. We're co-sponsoring the fifth annual Farm to Cafeteria Conference in Detroit on May 17 through 19. This is hosted by NGFN partner organization, the National Farm to School Network, in collaboration with the Urban and Environmental Policy Institute at Occidental College and the co-sponsors of today's webinar, the CFSC. Visit Farm to Cafeteria farmtocafeteriaconference.org for more information and registration forms. You can find us on YouTube, on Twitter at twitter.com slash ngfn and on our website ngfn.org. I'd like to encourage you to add your name, interests, your bio and other information to our growing database of people, organizations and funders, increasing your ability to connect to people within your regions and nationally. Look for the database link in the resources section of our website. Uh, and if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or you can let us know of your interest on being included on in mailings and the survey that will open in your browser in just a moment. Please contact us anytime. Email address is contact at ngfn.org. The ngfn.org would like to thank the CFSC and thank you for your time today. And this concludes the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Mm-hmm.